This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello, and welcome to API Conversations. I'm Marsha Barnhart, Chief of Investigations for the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, and your host for today's program. My guest for this episode is Professor Alexander Wendt, a distinguished scholar of political science at The Ohio State University, and moreover, the Mershon Professor of International Security at OSU. The Mershon Center is an academic think tank at OSU. This venue, a podcast dealing with matters of UAP, UFO, and anomalous experiences, is not a typical venue for the good professor, but he and a colleague, Dr. Raymond Duvall, penned a provocative chapter in Leslie Kane's book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record. That chapter was entitled Militant Agnosticism and the UFO Taboo. It was a synopsis of Wentz and Duvall's publication Sovereignty and the UFO, published in August 2008 in the influential peer-reviewed academic journal Political Theory. Wendt and Duvall put forth the argument that The root of UFO ignorance is political rather than scientific. As international relations and social science academics, they argue that although UFOs have never been scientifically and systematically investigated by the government or science, it is nonetheless assumed that UFOs are known not to be extraterrestrial. The authoritative claim that UFOs are not possibly extraterrestrial is not supportable. Why? Because UFOs have never been systematically investigated by science or the state. In their opinion, the reasoned approach should be that we remain agnostic when it comes to discussion of UFOs and the extraterrestrial hypothesis. That does not mean UFOs are ET evidence, no. That means we do not know with any degree of certainty what is behind the aerial phenomena experienced by hundreds of thousands of human beings over the course of written human history. Their publication further explained why they feel that the government, science, and mainstream media ignores and or condemns as irrational any reality to the question of UFOs. Google Sovereignty in the UFO and read it yourself. You will find it illuminating. My conversation with Dr. Wendt not only covered the UFO taboo, but we discuss his latest book, Quantum Mind and Social Science, and delve into his ideas and reasonings on a variety of topics that I feel will interest you. API Conversations with Dr. Alexander Wendt was recorded on May 17, 2017. You're a political scientist, you're an author, a scholar, and an academic, and a professor currently teaching at The Ohio State University. And in 1999, you wrote and published um, a work that that many in the field of international relations feel is the best work done in the last two decades, Social Theory of International Politics. And uh, you also just published a fascinating book that I'm currently reading, uh, Quantum Mind and Social Science, which puts forth essentially the ideas of quantum consciousness and panpsychism, which is right down my alley, essentially that consciousness is at the root of everything. And that is kind of what put you on my radar, uh, that and Leslie Kane's book, UFOs, Generals, Pilots, and Government Officials Go on the Record, which I devoured in 
found was just a seminal work and very important. So before we talk about the thing you did for Leslie Kane's book and your your piece that you wrote with uh, Professor Duvall on uh, sovereignty and the UFO, I would like to get some idea of of how you came to be who you are from your early life, how you came to be a social scientist or international relations um, scholar. Tell me about how you got here from there. Well, I've always been interested in international politics um, since I was an early teen. Um, and I went to college. I majored in philosophy for a while, but I discovered I wasn't a very good philosopher, and so I switched to political science kind of by happenstance, but I was just interested in politics. And then I got to my, you know, it was time to decide what to do after college. And well, the natural thing to do is go to grad school because with the BA in political science, you really can't do anything anyway. And my dad was a professor. And so I had a model to, you know, do the whole academic thing. Um, but I actually did not start out in grad school in international, in international politics. It was, I was doing other things and it was only in my end of my second year that I discovered, so to speak, international politics, and then everything kind of clicked, and everything else went fine after that. And I finished my PhD in 89, and, you know, I've had a, a really nice career since then, so. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's let's segue into how you came to write that chapter for Leslie Kane's book. That was published in 2011, and you had already written an article at Sovereignty and the UFO with Raymond Duvall in 2008. So how did you and Leslie Kane come together for that chapter in her book? Well, I was actually, um, after Duvall and I, he was my advisor in grad school, um, actually. Um, after he and I wrote our article, we were sort of just brainstorming people to send copies to, um, and I had been aware of Leslie's work on the UFO problem before, and so I just sent her a copy out of the blue, and she read it and was very excited, and she invited us to contribute a sort of a bridged and more um, ordinary language version of the paper uh, for her volume. And so um, and the timing was good, and um, the result is a much more readable version of the paper that um, appeared originally in the academic, on the academic side. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she speaks of that uh, chapter often from uh, things I've read about her. Now, what have you determined that other scholars and academics and social scientists feel about your point of view on that? What has been their take on it and your your feedback from uh, your contemporaries um, and colleagues on that work? Um, I would say deafening silence, um, which is funny because the thesis of the paper is that there's a taboo on the topic. And so the silence since the paper was published proves the thesis in a sense of the article. Um, But no, I think the article is actually, the journal it was published in, it's called Political Theory. I believe the article is the most downloaded article ever in that journal's history, but it's hardly ever been cited by academics. And I think it's just striking that something that, is quite controversial when you actually read it. Has nev- I have never seen a published response to the article by any academic anywhere. So it's been completely ignored, um, at least for its UFO aspect. Some people have picked up on some of the political theory stuff in there that doesn't have anything to do with UFOs. But um, So no, it's deafening silence, which is what we predicted. Um, and you know, But it's too bad. It, it is too bad, I think. Man, talk about proving a point, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, it is. It's sort of, uh, <laughs> um, but you know, it's gotten a lot of attention uh-huh. from you know the lay the lay public. Uh-huh. Just not the academics. The so-called experts are the ones that ignored it, right? So yeah. Well, so you didn't get any kind of um, low-level or clandestine blowback on that from your peers. Just silence. Uh, I would say silence. I mean, my own colleagues in my department, um, I think it made them a bit uncomfortable um, mm-hmm. to talk about it at, you know, faculty dinners and stuff like that. So no one, you know, people were happy to skip over <laughs> that topic. Um, but they've been pretty tolerant, actually, my own colleagues. They've, no one has ever criticized the paper. I don't think most of them have read it. Um, and they prefer to pretend that it doesn't exist, I think, and that's fine. You know, I understand their their point of view on this, so. You were kind of, though, um, in danger of living the John Mack 
a scenario. Did you ever worry about that? His, his treatment by his colleagues, his learned colleagues, on his very scholarly work just about made him lose his job. Yes. Now, he was treated very poorly. Um, his claims were more controversial than the ones that Duvall and I make. I mean, we deliberately don't, don't deal with the abduction phenomenon. Uh, we're deliberately agnostic about the UFO question. So, you know, we're pretty cautious in our article. Um, and partly it was because I saw what happened to Mac. Um, and he, it was a video of him that actually got me interested in the UFO phenomenon in the start, to start with. So, but no, we, we experienced nothing like the treatment he experienced. Rather than the, just the theoretical examination of UFOs, what we colloquially call UFOs, and the attending weirdness that comes with UFOs and, and um, the possible ETH, what do you feel is evidence pointing to the extraterrestrial hypothesis and UFOs and that type of thing, and, and the evidence against ETH? Well, there's not much evidence either way because no one has bothered to look very systematically. Um, so all we have is very anecdotal evidence, whether it's eyewitness reports. But then we do have a lot of radar reports now, um, a lot from the military in particular. And that's the evidence that I find most persuasive. Um, <clears throat> when F-16 pilots land, and they're all excited because they just were chasing some UFOs and they couldn't keep up with the UFOs and they're freaking out. Um, and that somehow gets into the public domain. Um, and there are many, many cases like that in many different countries of, of fighter pilots um, dealing with these phenomena. These guys are professionals. They have no, no incentive at all to lie about something like this, to make up this kind of stuff. And they spend hundreds, even thousands of hours in the sky, so which none of us have done. So when I think when I think about the evidence that I find most compelling, it's that. But and what that evidence suggests is that whatever these UFO phenomena are, they seem to be under intentional control. They seem to move intentionally. They're not moving randomly. They're moving as if they're under the intelligent control of some organism or something. So, but, you know, that's not scientific evidence. That's just anecdotes. Um, so, in a sense, it's not evidence at all. Um, but, on the other hand, I challenge the skeptics to talk to some of these pilots and convince those pilots that they didn't see anything of interest. Um, and I think that'd be a tough sell. Because these guys are not fools, you know, and they're professionals. Yeah, but the, the problem has been, and I, I read some skeptic rebuttals to your piece, and they also prove your point, too. You know, they keep making the same arguments that prove your point. But as far as I can tell, there is data, but this the UFO taboo that you often talk about, how is how can one break through that? What is the methodology to finally get people to pay attention to a very real phenomenon, whatever it may be? And, and you're agnostic about it, um, remaining agnostic. There is something. Now, how to get academics and scientists and government officials to probe that question? Well, I think when it comes to government officials, we're beginning to see some movement in the past five years, uh, especially in South America. Several governments now have directed their air forces to at least collect the data and reports that come in when pilots have encounters. That doesn't mean they're setting up radars and all kinds of stuff to look for UFOs, but at least they're collecting the reports, which is a big first step. Um, and the French have been doing this for a while, and they've even investigated a few cases. Um, so there is movement. Now, in the U.S., of course, there's zero movement at the governmental level, and I don't think there ever will be any movement in the U.S. case. So I think the efforts to have disclosure of the United States, I think this is a, a gigantic waste of time. It's never going to happen. Um, and, I mean, it's worthwhile. I don't mean to say it's a waste of time in that sense. It's worthwhile. It's important for the government to divulge everything they know. Um, but even if they did divulge everything they know, I think what, what they would be divulging is that they actually don't know what the phenomenon is. That's what they would have to divulge. Um, so they would divulge their ignorance. So the governmental side is a mixed picture, I think. Um, 
you know, the lay public, of course, is very interested. So the real issue is the scientific community, uh, besides the government. Um, and I think there, I think a lot of individual scientists are curious or open, relatively open-minded as long as there were good data. So what you need is good scientific data, um, physical, you know, radar reports, whatever it is, um, you know, cameras and all that kind of stuff, uh, physical evidence of some kind um, that's very systematic and scientific, and that will, I think, get the attention of some in the scientific community. And that's what this nonprofit that I set up. Yeah, your UFO data team. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit more, how the crowdfunding for this automated UFO surveillance network system that, that you and a host of other scientists and Leslie Kane are involved in. Um, how is that coming, and how do you plan to deploy that, and what's your uh, ideas moving forward on that? Well, um, you know, it's moved very slowly, um, and we've encountered any number of roadblocks along the way that it's, you know, because we're all doing this on a volunteer basis, um, and we all have lives and jobs and stuff, and so it's been, it's been challenging, but we've sort of gradually moved forward and overcome various roadblocks, and we, we've recruited more and more people. Uh-huh. Um, you know, we're at kind of a crossroads now about what direction to go, because we're not raising as much money as we had hoped, but we're not yet crowdfunding. We're not, we haven't yet done an actual crowdfunding. We've been sort of keeping that powder dry because uh-huh. you only get one shot, we assume. Um, so, um, but the concept is a good one, and we've had a lot of interest from some foundations that are sort of non mainstream science foundations that might have money for us. Um, so we'll see. But, you know, it's, it's a slow process. Um, and especially getting a bunch of volunteers all over the world to kind of work together um, and on the same time schedule turns out to be actually quite difficult. So, um, um, so you know, but we're going to keep chipping away and eventually something will happen, I think. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of an ad hoc thing at this point. So the idea is to deploy detection devices pointed towards the sky in essentially areas that are typically in the past known to have had anomalous activity. And um, places in the states, there's there's multiple places in the states. I think uh, Utah Valley are, is one place. So the idea is to get a group of um of skyward-looking cameras with special optics and uh, special detection equipment. And then when that gets triggered, that data is going to be automatically downloaded to a, uh, a server and maybe alerts sent out that something has triggered that. And then somebody would, would hit that server and take a look at the video and the data and then try to collate information off that. Is that the idea? Yes, that's all exactly the idea. The only slight change I would make is that we haven't decided yet where to deploy. You know, some of us have thought the best way to go is to go with so-called hotspots. Uh Others on the team think that it makes more sense to just go with what's convenient and nearby one, a team member or whatever. So, um, you know, step one is, of course, just building one of these things. And that's, if we can get one built, it'll be easier, I think, Mm -hmm. to get a lot built. The idea is to build one and have that be the star of a video for the crowdfunding. Uh But getting the one built without crowdfunding is, that's the hard part. So, um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're finding workarounds and, you know, and we're kind of keeping at it. So. Well, you know, there's there's several other people I've been hearing that is doing essentially the same thing. I don't know if you're connected, but there is some guy, I can't remember his name now, but he has made um, many, many uh, realistic UFO models and um, alien characters for the movies. And he's got this van, apparently, that is chock full. Oh, uh, it's Trumbull. Trumbull, it's yes. Trumbull. Yes, yes. Yes, yes, we're we're aware of his efforts. Yes, very much so. So kind of, and then there's this other guy I remember uh, hearing. He put his own money together and was deploying a low Earth orbit little mini satellite. Uh, there's a name for those. I forget what they oh, are. Oh yeah. And he's going to throw that out, and it, it'll yeah. 
it'll stay up for a certain period of time and collect information. And that really is, you know, like this gigantic net that he's going to try to catch something with. But there is, you know, here's the sad thing that it's taking all these individuals with this um, big interest in trying to examine this question in a scientific manner, doing the work that you would think most uh, large university scientists interested in plasma and and alternate energy and space travel and, and all this type of thing, it's just mind-boggling that there is yeah. paralysis in that. It really, it just strains credulity. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, we were talking about how and you'd mentioned in Sovereignty and the UFO, that the problem is with governmental agencies, the government authority, and with the academic community and with mainstream media. This triad is essentially just keeping things from being done for whatever reason. And uh, so that is true. There are these roadblocks that have been thrown up by by human entities. But that made me think of having done many um, interviews and, and um, UFO investigations. I'm often struck with a very common phenomenon that occurs where people see something and it ain't from here. And it is something that they forget to talk about. They forget to tell someone about until sometimes months later, sometimes years later. And I mean, it is something that just completely unwraps your mind and they don't even think to go home and tell the wife that. Mm. So I'm thinking whatever this phenomenon is could also have some aspect of its being that seems to anesthetize this portion of us that would normally be exceedingly interested in examining this strange thing that just occurred. Have you thought about that or run into that much? It's it's not just the human agency, but perhaps something unexplicable that is partially driving this paralysis that we seem to run into. Well, that's interesting. I, I haven't thought about that, so my reaction is kind of off the cuff. I guess what I, I would distinguish between the experience of experiencers who've had actual encounters and had memory loss or, um, you know, the missing time phenomenon, and um, but often, you know, the memories are recovered much later. Those are people who have had direct, if there's any kind of <clears throat> sort of memory suppression or something like that going on from the phenomenon, uh-huh. then those are the people that will be the, the sort of targets of that. Now, that's one thing. The other, the, but the rest of the world, which has not had these encounters and is sort of keeping a lid on the UFO phenomenon, the establishment, basically, I would say the establishment has its own reasons for just refusing to open the question, which are perfectly human reasons. And I don't personally think there's any alien um, component to that. But the experiencers, I remain agnostic. You know, I have no idea what they encountered, um, and I'm not going to try to pretend that I know. Yeah. Um, so. Well, the anecdotal evidence has piled up, yes. and uh, mm-hmm. I, I have had exactly that experience, so I can, from firsthand knowledge, um, report that that is a strange phenomenon that occurs. <clears throat> um, and so, uh, and I remember talking just recently with um, Francis Barwood, who was... She was the councilwoman in Phoenix who raised the question after the Phoenix Lights phenomenon occurred when all these people, and and she got, she talked to 700 people herself, and those 700 people had been around two or three people, if not a crowd of people, Mm -hmm. and it was it was just a shocking thing that many of them had for either forgotten about it or did not feel like telling someone about it or just didn't didn't even think to mention it. Hundreds of them didn't think to mention it until an article had come out about it. And they said, yes, wow, that's right. Remember, we saw this huge black triangle the size of a football field fly over us? How did we forget 
to tell somebody about that. And they weren't just, it wasn't a case of just making this up. Oh, I want to just pile on this article. I, I don't think it was a case of that. A, a skeptic could say that, but it could just as easily be not that. But uh, this is a phenomenon that has occurred over and over and over. And, and that's part of this strangeness that, you know, taken with the fact that the government doesn't want to talk about it, and for some reason, science doesn't want to tackle it, and the media is in cahoots and won't do it. You're right. I don't know that it's ever going to... No, it, it is going to come out. It is. Somehow, something's going to bust it out. Yeah, it'll come out eventually. But I th again, I think that the, the fact that people who've had these experiences often don't remember or didn't tell anybody, that could be because... The, the phenomenon or the experience is so unexpected or so out of, out of the ordinary that the mind just kind of reacts by shutting down and not even seeing it, literally not seeing the phenomenon, mm -hmm. and then maybe it's only recovered later. So mm -hmm. that might have nothing to do with the phenomenon itself, except that it's so strange that the human mind sometimes can't come to grips with it right away. So I, I don't know if I would you know push a, necessarily an, an ET explanation for that kind of memory effect. But certainly that's a separate thing from what the government and the media are doing, yeah. which is, you know, completely about a different, that's about just maintaining common sense, what they think is common sense. Yeah, I, I suppose you could biologically uh, say, or physiologically say that when somebody sees something so incredible, it almost, you know, blows out the amygdala and, and a little message doesn't get laid down there as a memory or something. I mean, it could be, it could be any number of things, but there, there does seem to be a there, there. I just, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm agnostic too. I have no idea what it is, but it's something has been going on for a long time and, yeah. and it seems to coalesce into certain areas. Now let's just say just for sake of chitty chat, since you are an international relations guy and, and you're essentially a social scientist, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in in November 2014, American University hosted you you know about this a three hour symposium around Leslie Kane's book, and the host of that symposium was um, an international relations professor, Patrick Jackson, yes. at American University. Mm -hmm. You probably know him, yes. and of course, he mentioned yours and Duvall's article and. And I thought what he said was very interesting, and I want to ask you. He says, uh, what are international relations about if not an encounter with the other in some way? In this case, it would be the alien. So have you ever even entertained the possibility as how you as um, an international relations academic could um, interact with an alien species? Is there any model that, that would allow you to be conversant with and, and discuss international relations and get into the mind of an alien? It's, it's an impossible thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think that would be very hard. I mean, I guess, I mean, people, I've talked with some people about this question on occasion and formally, and, you know, the one model that people often sort of trot out is, well, it'd be kind of like when Columbus came to the New World, Right. Um, and Columbus had guns and horses, and so he was technologically more advanced than the Native Americans. Um, and so we humans are in the position of the Native Americans, and the aliens are like Columbus. And I think the analogy doesn't work because the, the difference, if there are aliens in the sky, the difference between us and them is way, way bigger than between Columbus and the Native Americans. I think it's more like when human beings go into the jungle of Africa and discover apes. Uh, living there, gorillas, you know, gorillas were only discovered like around 1900 or something like that. Uh -huh. So, and we're the gorillas. So um, can a gorilla imagine what it's like to live in a human society? I don't think so. Um, so I think it's, it's extremely difficult to imagine, certainly from an international relations perspective, if there were an alien presence revealed, international politics would be irrelevant, I think. It would now be aliens versus, or not versus, maybe. Maybe they'd be friendly. Who knows? But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's much. Um, it's, it, if it is more like gorillas and humans, then, or even worse, 
then uh, there's not going to be much in the way of international politics there. Well, you don't delve much into the UFO field because that's not really your bailiwick. But when you read many accounts of and uh, talk to people who have had first in, first-hand encounters, these beings are anthropomorphic. Yeah. And... Um, If one takes that what they are saying, and for the sake of argument, we will, if they take that what they're saying is factual and it actually occurred and this was a real creature that had substance and it wasn't just something of one's mind, these creatures apparently do communicate, Mm -hmm. interact, have some sort of social structure that they seem to have certain social norms Mm -hmm. and they interact with the human species very much in an anthropomorphic vein. And I would think that if that were the case, then perhaps very important would be people of uh, a social scientist who would, who would kind of gravitate to and begin an understanding and a communication and a dialogue that would then be beneficial? Um, Ideally, that would be the case. That assumes that if there were alien intelligence and it revealed itself, that assumes that it would care what we think um, or respect our intelligence enough to have a dialogue. You know, if they view us like ants, if that's the difference between us and them, mm-hmm. you know, we would never engage in a dialogue with ants. So I think if, if her presence is revealed, um, the, it's going to be, the agenda is going to be completely in their control, completely in their control. And we'll be basically whatever they want to do, that's going to be the terms that we're going to be dealing with them on. So um, I think it's wishful thinking to think that we're going to have a, a, a dialogue of equals here. The technology difference is clearly deeply profound and maybe even not just technology, but if they have capacities for, you know, um, parapsychological, you know, capacities and stuff like that, then, which has been reported, then, you know, they're clearly in a different realm than human beings are. Yeah. It's scary. It's a scary thought, I think, actually, when you think about it. It is kind of scary. Yeah. Hence the taboo. (laughs) You know, yeah, that's part of the, why the taboo is there. That's right. I think that's right. Clearly, whatever this species is or this this power is, it knows how to exploit our um, our lack of perception for it. And uh, it, you're right; it it can do what it wants because it's exceedingly more intelligent and capable than we are. But you know, you apparently have had no personal experiences with or or known or talked to others that have had anomalous experiences? You've had none? Uh, I've had none, and I think I met somebody once who had one, but um, no, I haven't known people in general that have had them either. Mm -hmm. And in the circles you run in, most people, even if they had, would not pull you over and grab a cup of coffee and tell you, I suspect, yes? Yes. That's almost certainly true, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'd be surprised if many of my colleagues had had experiences anyway. But if they had, they probably actually if they had, they probably would tell me. I think because I'm not, I mean I'm I've outed myself so to speak with this issue, and so anybody who's interested in UFOs, you know, uh, is probably happy to talk to me about it if they're an academic. But there are many, as far as I can tell. It's pretty much a third rail, you know. Our our director is a professor of astronomy. Uh, and our deputy director is a space systems engineer. And neither one of them, even though they're in this work, would approach their colleagues. And it's just not something you do. They just, they just don't do it. Here they are in this, this, you know, business of trying to figure out what UFOs are, and they don't think it's good for their career to question their learned academic scientific colleagues about what they might have seen, because they know these people are not going to tell them, and they would shy away and probably shun them if they asked that question. It's really endemic, in, in, and you know that. Well, that's why I think that the challenge is not to persuade academics um, I don't, I think that, um, by talking to them, they're never going yeah. to be persuaded by anything except scientific evidence. So if you produce the evidence, that's the thinking behind our, the nonprofit, if you produce the evidence, 
the scientific community in the end cannot ignore it completely as long as you keep producing more and more of it. So, you know, my belief is that there is a phenomenon there, whatever it is. And so if we can just Mm -hmm. get things moving and produce the evidence, it's just a matter of time. And especially now with the attitude changing in South American governments, I think we're gradually seeing more openness on this whole issue. And um, so, you know, maybe, maybe the taboo in the end will, will break. And the thing about taboos is they're often brittle. So, you know, it could shatter very quickly. And all of a sudden there's a complete flip in public opinion at the elite level. And they say, oh, of course we should be investigating this. Uh Oh, there's millions of dollars in research grants that we could make, you know, investigating this and so on. Think of the plasma technologies and everything else. And all the stuff you were saying earlier, all of a sudden becomes, oh, obvious is what we should do. So I can imagine a complete reversal um, down the road at some point if there's enough evidence that kind of produces that kind of change. Yeah. Then they'd all beat a, a pathway to the door, but a couple of brave souls have to pop up and do it. But actually, brave souls had. There's been a trickle of, you know, well-known scientists that have have delved into this, but it there it's getting no traction. And I don't know, but what after Leslie Kane published her book, you know, there was kind of crickets, even though government officials and pilots and generals had attested to there being evidence, um, certainly of a sort. So it is just about an intractable position. I don't know what's going to finally be the thing that busts that wall. Well, but just note that you know all the generals and uh, astronomers and everybody in Leslie's book, they're, they're talking about their own experiences or the experiences of their colleagues. <clears throat> it's all anecdotes. It's not scientific evidence that they're producing. Um, and that evidence has never been produced on either side, because, of course, the skeptics won't look for it, because, of course, there's nothing to see um, in their view. But, you know, on, the, on the, the pro side, so to speak, we haven't had the resources and money and technology to produce the evidence that's needed. So I think until that's produced, you know, the, the whole issue is, is moot. Well, yeah, then there's that thing, you know, what is evidence? I recall a quote of yours from a rebuttal to a skeptic, you know, saying, well, you trying to prove, you, you can't prove God either. And you were saying, you know, something like, well, God doesn't leave a, a radar trace right. in an F-16's gun uh, camera. Um, yeah. Camera. Mm-hmm. So can't we say that there is some evidence to this? being an actual phenomenon that is worth scientific scrutiny? Can't we say that at this point, that there is some data and some evidence? Oh, yes. I I would certainly agree that there's enough anecdotal and even, you know, physical evidence so far to justify looking more deeply. Certainly, I would agree with that. And that's what's stunning to me is that I think, in fact, that the case for looking more deeply is so blindingly obvious, given the potential payoff, Mm -hmm. that I just cannot understand at all why people wouldn't do that. But that's different than saying there's enough evidence to say what the phenomenon is or what its patterns are like or anything like that. I think all we have right now are hints, really, that something's happening but much, much more systematic data would need to be collected over, over a large area and over a period of time to really pick out the phenomenon and begin to draw some conclusions. And that's so we're only one percent of the way in on the science side, basically, if that. Yeah, yeah. Say. Drawing conclusions were a long ways off, but I would say that there is ample uh, evidence. For lack of a better term, there is ample evidence right now that there is something going on. Now, you know, I was, I'm was i reading a book, UFOs and the Government, and this is where uh, uh, several authors are looking at uh, Freedom of Information Act documents that they've gotten from the government, mm-hmm. talking about the government being exceedingly interested in many of this strange reports from people, and um, and also at the same time, completely discounting them with the silliest of explanations that don't hold any water at all. And uh, for the most part, they were just never questioned. But I I think that there is ample evidence to certainly make scientists interested in this, but but they aren't. You know, that that reminded me, uh, this, this whole strange thinking that is common for us humans in the 
novella Flatland. You did you read Flatland? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. The interesting thing about that is that the typical problem here, and this was a guy who discussed this in novella form in 1884, mm-hmm. and his character was in a two-dimension flatland, but the the authorities there in the two dimensions could not abide by a notion of a third dimension. And the one-dimension inhabitants of this area, Lineland, could not abide by the idea of two dimensions, and the three-dimension Spacelanders couldn't abide the notion of any higher dimensions than themselves. And they were incapable of entertaining anything above themselves. Perhaps they could entertain something less than themselves, but nothing more than themselves. But through all this, the authorities of each dimension knew of and kept secret from their population the fact of these higher dimensional inhabitants. It's, to my mind, a kind of human nature, and it's authority subverting knowledge. That has just continued and continued and continued and written about in 1884 still going on now humans seem to be the way humans are but your your take on this isn't that it's humans so much as it's social systems that are causing this right well it's both i think it's the social it's social structures that's true and the political structure and so on but it's also i think human the way human minds function and human fears and so on and um to me, the, the problem here, and I think what you're pointing to, is, is human hubris, basically, and that every generation thinks like, oh, wow, we're the smartest generation that's ever existed, and we're the smartest beings that have ever existed. And, and my own feeling, and I felt this long before I got interested in UFOs, is that human beings know much less about the universe than we think we do. Mm. Um, and that we're actually basically just coming out of the dark ages, really. And we've got a, you know, a long way to go to figure out you know, fundamental questions about the nature of reality and so on. So yes. um, the idea that we've got, that we know what's possible in terms of space, inter, you know, stellar flight and so on, it's absurd. We have no idea yes. what's possible and what's not possible. So right. um, let's, just, let's just kind of step back and have some more modesty here and, and, you know, but you're right. It's not going to change easily. But what will change it is scientific. The nice thing about science is that it's self-correcting. So if you produce the evidence, eventually people will have to pay attention. Will they? <laughs> That's the hope. Anyway. Will they? <laughs> will they? Well, you would think so. You would hope it, so. It would take time. Well, yeah, that, that whole thing about... What we don't know, you know, as I was telling you, our deputy director, Paul Carr, he's a space systems engineer, real smart guy. And um, I often remind him, you know, that as much as we know, we know nothing. Yes. We know nothing of all there is to know. We're just starting to wrap our little gray matter around quantum quantum mechanics. And I'm enjoying your book very much. You know, um, The Quantum Mind, I'm very... It's pretty out there. It's pretty out there. Not not where I live. It's right in my neighborhood where I live. That's true. That's true. Yeah. It's, for my for my crowd, it's pretty out there. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm sure that yeah. uh, you probably heard crickets from them on that too. But I yeah, I'm right there with you. And I I think of consciousness as really all there is. I don't even know what all exists. Isn't that kind of an in the area of solipsism where you all all that exists is what you think exists. We don't know anything. We don't know anything around us. And we're just wandering around in the dark. And we think we're just so very smart. It's, we've got a lot to learn. But we're trying. And that's the neat thing. Yeah. And I like, I like the way, you're, way you put it is that we know nothing. <laughs> not only do we not understand quantum mechanics, and we don't understand consciousness. Mm. We do not understand the UFO problem. We do not know if there's life on other planets. Um, which is a pretty basic question. <laughs> you know, there's like some really fundamental issues. We don't know how to j- join relativity theory and, and quantum theory. Um, we don't have an explanation for gravity. I mean, there's all these gigantic questions right. about the nature of the universe that we don't have. We have got theories, mm-hmm. and maybe one of them is right, but mm-hmm. right now we're a long way from knowing. And, you know, but I'm just a political scientist. You know, what does a political scientist know? I don't do real science. Yeah, but you really rolled up your sleeves and dove deep down into quantum mechanics. You might be a political scientist, but... Well, I did the best I could. You did a deep dive. 
Well, I appreciate that. And I, you know, and I have gotten positive feedback on those chapters in particular, that I did a nice job laying out the basic ideas of quantum theory and uh-huh. for, for a lay person, um, for a person who does not know the math, since I don't know the math myself. Well, I am of a mind that the answers to the things we've been experiencing, these anomalous events, I'm of a mind that the answers will come when we have a better understanding of things in the quantum level, because you know what? That's the real world. In my opinion, how things work at the quantum level is the real world. Yeah. And the classical level is this kind of overlay, yeah. this, this uh, filter that comes down for us to comport ourselves through the world as these human biological machines with this particular set of input device and peripherals. And if we get down to the quantum level, we will see what is really around us. And that then is a matter of time. We are going there and perhaps getting a better understanding of the real world in the quantum level might be what slowly opens that crack and we can start looking at the phenomena around us and answering it at the quantum level. That's my hope. Yeah, no, I, I actually totally agree with you. And I think the quantum level, even though in a sense it's not real in the traditional sense, that's really where reality is in a sense, or that's the ultimate reality or whatever you might, however you might want to put it. And, um, and once we figure that out and, and put all the pieces together, that's going to produce a revolution, I think, in human consciousness. And, and hopefully it'll come soon enough for human beings to deal with what are becoming now planetary scale problems like climate change and so on, which are going to require significant changes in consciousness and um, you know how that's going to happen. I and mean, that's where an area as a political scientist, I worry um, because uh-huh. you know the, the damage is already built and already cooked into the system in a sense, the future damage and, and political systems respond very slowly to problems like this. So it's, it's, of course, you know, I'll be long dead. We'll all be long dead by the time the problem gets really bad. So I guess that's the good news. <laughs> so. Yep. Well, time will tell on that, huh? Yes. Mm-hmm. I can't make a wager either way. Well, so what, what do you have in your future? Are you working on a new book or um, what's the future for you, Dr. Went? Um, I'm just working on uh, currently kind of um, responding to critics of my quantum book. Uh, I have to write several papers doing that. Um, that's probably going to take at least another year or so. So I'm sort of doing just that for the time being. Uh huh. And it's incumbent upon you to defend your piece. That is part of what you are mandated to do. You can't just say, "Look, if if you don't believe it, fine. You you can't. You must defend it." Oh, I could do that. I could I could not defend it. I could just say, you know, I said what I said, and that's all I'm going to do. But. I think it's actually helpful Mm -hmm. to respond to the critics in these kind of more organized ways because the book is very hard for people who have no background in this area, which I didn't when I started it, to to read and to figure out what I'm saying. And so having reading a critique and then reading my response and then a counter response and stuff, I think is very helpful for readers to kind of digest uh, the ideas. Uh So it's, it's partly instrumental and partly I just want to defend the argument because I think some of the critiques are really stupid and shallow. Uh Um, Some of them are very good, but I think some of them are surprisingly shallow, which does not surprise me. So I guess I shouldn't say surprisingly, but uh, (laughs) remarkably shallow Uh that way. So, and you wonder if they actually read what you said, because if, if they actually read what you said, they wouldn't be saying what they're saying. That was the same thing I found in Sovereignty and the UFO. Did you read what he said? If you did, you wouldn't be saying that. You are proving his point. Yeah, well, that's, they may have read it, but it didn't sink in. That, that does happen. <laughs> yeah, well, it, it's a big read. Often I have to Google your terms in international relations and social science terms and stuff like that. There's a lot of jargon. So it's been kind of a a slow trail, but I'm very much enjoying it, and I'm glad you wrote it, and I thank you. I enjoy it. Well, good. Well, thank you. I I appreciate that. You aren't a guy who does the same thing twice, so God only knows what you're going to do next. (laughs) Well, I'm taking a little breather right now, um, but yeah. Well, I've I've always believed that, you know, being an academic, it's it's the best job in the world, I think, at least for me. Uh Um, and it's a job that I think can, um, it's an incredible privilege to be able to get paid decent money to have a lot of free time and write whatever I want to write. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just 
believed for a long time that if I'm going to have that kind of a job, I should say something uh -huh. that others are not going to say or that others can't say. Yeah. Um, and so I've always looked for kind of, I've never wanted to sort of just reinforce the conventional wisdom. It's always been about subverting the conventional wisdom. Um, cause I think that's part of the academic's job. You want to break new ground. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, you know, you know, someone's got to do it. And <laughs> there are a lot of people doing it. And so, yeah. Well, you know, I often wondered if somebody takes a decade to write a book, how do you decompress from a decade's worth of work? It's published and it's it's out and then you sit down in your easy chair and you grab a beer and say, whoa. And how do you decompress from 10 years worth of immersing yourself in such a subject? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think uh, <laughs> I think there was some postpartum effects right <laughs> after I got done. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it is a decompression. And, and this also happened after my first book, which, you know, came out in 99. And it took me a couple of years to kind of recharge the batteries and figure out what I wanted to do next. And, um, and this book took longer and was harder than the first one. So, uh -huh. um, but yeah, I don't know what's going to happen. But, um, you know, I figure I can take a little bit of a breather now. Well, I can't even imagine doing that. I would probably slit my wrists. I can't imagine dedicating that much time. So well, I almost did a few times myself. So. <laughs> oh, God. Well, God bless ye. Well, thank you. Well, it's it's one hell of a book. I got to tell you, I am really enjoying it. And um, and uh, so I thank you. I'm I'm one happy reader here, Dr. Wendt. Good, good. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. And um yeah, I've had some people, you know, some people really have been very complimentary about it, um, uh -huh. you know, very much so. So it's a mixed, mixed reaction. That's what I expected. Well, I hope you stay in this, this anomaly field. I mean, I, I know you are because of that UFO data system you guys are going to try to put together. Yeah, yeah, we're, that's always going to be there. Um, it may take, you know, who knows how many more years, but eventually that's going to surface. So, you know, just be on the lookout. <laughs> this may take a while. I find it interesting that you're that interested in it because lots of times people who have not had anomalous experiences don't get so so engaged in it, you know. Um, so I think that's a, a really good thing. You know, I read a quote that you said your father gave you some time ago that you said your father taught you that the way forward in science is to yeah. look for anomalies, right. not just patterns. So what, what brought your father to that point of view and, and how do you live that? So I don't know what, I mean, he's always, his own research as a professor um, of psychology was always a bit offbeat. Um, also, um, he was always interested in, you know, he was interested in patterns and not just anomalies. But later in life, he became interested in anomalies. He joined SSE and, um, and has always been very intrigued and open-minded about all the anomalies that, you know, get reported. I mean, he's skeptical about some, but... Um, you know, and in, in my case, so, I mean, so he's modeled that behavior to me as an academic his whole life, kind of thinking outside the box or thinking independently anyway, and not just following the herd. Um, and I believe very strongly in that as a personal kind of, um, responsibility as an academic, um, of not following the herd and, um, you know, and it's more fun this way. So, you know, I have a good time. I can't complain. Well, what what do anomalies tell us? What is the value of anomalies if we were to mine them? Well, I think it depends. I mean, sometimes the anomalies can be made to go away with better measurements, um, better statistics, you know, better interpretation, whatever it is. So sometimes the anomalies are only temporary. Um, but if you work at them and you keep poking at them and trying to explain them and they don't go away, then that tells you that something is wrong with how you're thinking about the world. Um, and so consciousness is an anomaly, it seems to me, for the materialist worldview. And when you think about it hard enough, you realize, oh, materialism must be wrong <laughs> because the anomaly just won't go away. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, so you have to kind of prod them and, and do your best. And eventually most of them probably will be made to go away, but some of them won't. And those will be the ones that create revolutions like the quantum revolution and others. And the UFO anomaly, is it not going away? It's not going away either. Yeah, it's been long, as you know, decades, if not centuries. Um, and, 
you know, and it may not be a single anomaly. It may be a, a variety of different anomalies. We shouldn't assume it's only a single phenomenon, um, but it's not going away. The reports continue to come in and, you know, it's just so, which is good because that means it'll always be there for us to work on. Eventually, we'll, somebody will pick up the ball and we'll figure it out. Yep, I hope so. Well, I think that concludes our uh, interview, and I sure do appreciate your time. Boy, you are a hard fellow to land. <laughs> well, I was teaching, and the problem was the semester. I just finished the semester a week ago, and so until then, it's like craziness around here with email and students. And I know you were terribly busy. I mean, it's fun, but it's just way very, very intense. But I'm glad we were able to. I'm glad you were very patient with me and um, you know, finally got me nailed down here. So, and then thank you very much for having me on the show and feel free to stay in touch by all means. Clearly, Dr. Alexander Wendt has a penchant for saying what others are not saying or don't dare say. His paper, Sovereignty and the UFO, and his latest book, Quantum Mind and Social Science, Unifying Physical and Social Ontology, provide an avenue of new thinking. And his work with the UFO Data Project aids in the effort to help prod scientific study into UFO research. Fittingly, as Alexander Wendt's father counseled years ago, the way forward in science is to look for the anomalies not just the patterns. There is perhaps no better known anomaly than the UFO phenomenon. Yes, there is a taboo around the subject of UFOs. There is extreme reluctance to openly look into this phenomenon. But this subject must be brought into the light of mainstream science and studied in a systematic, scientific, rigorous, methodical manner that will eventually lead to a better understanding of the world we inhabit and the secrets still openly hidden around us. As he said, the thing about taboos is they are often brittle and they can shatter very quickly. And when this taboo shatters, the vast repository of possible new technology could be staggering if this phenomenon is due to a higher intelligence or offer an entirely new branch of science, gaining a new understanding of natural, as of yet unknown, physical science processes. There is a potential paradigm-shifting goldmine out there awaiting those who have the background and resources to scientifically dig into this phenomenon. Scientific data will shatter the UFO taboo. On the subject of scientific data, the next API case files will include a lengthy segment with the director of the UFO Data Project team, Dr. Mark Rodiger. He will discuss in depth the instrumentation, deployment, and gathering of scientific data planned for this project. Until then, thank you for listening to this Episode 6 of API Conversations with Dr. Alexander Wendt. Professor of Political Science at The Ohio State University and Mershon Professor of International Security at OSU. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart. API Conversations is a spin-off of API Case Files. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. The spoken content of API Conversations is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license, as is the music heard during this program by DJ Spooky and William Tyler. Links to information on this episode of API Conversations are included in the show notes. Be sure to check out our other API conversations as well as API case files at www.apicasefiles.com.